See you sucker soon on a hot summer day. Coffee comes back in a nerve wracking way. The dishes and laundry take the garbage out. What a day! What a day! What a day! Well, welcome to Capital Region today. We're so happy you're joining us today. We've got a great lineup today and a little bit of a few treats for you as well. Weather's been great. I mean, no snow. That's always a good thing. Well, at least we hope so for a while, but a little snow at Christmas would be nice. But we're gonna, we have a great lineup today, so let me just tell you who's coming on the show today. We're going to be talking about Beat the Snow Concerts. That's over in Schenectady Public Library. They do that on Clinton Avenue, and they start in January and end in March, so we've got lots of treats coming up there. And then we're going to be talking about flowers, Blooms by Marie, and we're going to find out what she's up to and what she's doing for the holidays and those kind of uh, presentations. And then we're going to be talking uh, to representatives from the New Russia Cultural Center. We're going to be talking about a performance that they're doing, and it will be done both in Russian and in English. And it's uh, a bit about the Holocaust, but it's a, a different slant on it. So we're going to be talking about that. And then we're going to be talking about the Festival of Trees, one of my favorite events coming up. And they actually have their events at the Schenectady um, Historical Society and also at the Y. So you can walk right between them and lots of Christmas trees to look at. And then we're going to be talking about a book called Metro Fix. It has to do about uh, how a company town changed. And I'm so happy that William Patrick is here to talk about that as well. And then we're going to be talking about one of my favorite places, the U.S. Postal Service. Yes, really, I do like the post office. And we're going to be talking about that and the challenges that they've been facing over the years and what's happening now to them. And we want to make sure you get those letters and packages delivered through the holidays. And we'll be talking to a representative, Jim Kaufman, about that. Well, right now we're going to start out with our first guest. And uh, I have with us Janice Walls. Actually, she uh, took her hat off as being my technical director. And she's at the table today to talk about Beat the Snow concert. She's the producer of that. Along with that, she's brought Roseanne Hargrave with her. And she's a soprano. And I think she's going to even sing a little bit for us today. So let's, uh, let's see how this all works out. Hi, Jan. Good to have Hello. you on the show. Yeah. Have you at the table this I time? I know. I know. I used to be here once yes, upon a time. Yes, I know. Yes, talking about Proctor's <laughs> Historical. Yes, yes. Yeah, and A2 Club and Light Opera and a few yeah, other things. Everything. But, yeah, well, Jan today, is everywhere. Right? But today, we're talking about a another Beat the Snow concert series. And it's, uh, the concerts are held every Sunday and it will be planned for 2 p.m. And that's a change, so 2 p.m. And it's in the McChesney Room. And we know the McChesney Room the has wonderful, are wonderful acoustics. And we've got a great piano and things. So- And you brought Roseanne you, Harker I with you. I did. And, I was going to say, this is my seventh year of organizing that, and I know that it had been around at least six years before I took oh, it yeah. over, and Roseanne has been one of the stalwarts in our concert series. Well, she's got a beautiful voice. Yes, yes, yes. And We're going to hear a sample of it, too. Yeah. time and effort into creating really creative programs. And what I love, as I start in, you know, September to give people a call, people are so willing to come and volunteer their time to do this. And groups like um, Musicians of Malwick, and we know that they are everywhere, but they do uh, concerts for us. The Etude Club, um, Light Opera, Donald Hyman. Oh, yeah. You know? Comes on our show. And on your show. And we have some grad students from SCCC. And they have also, a wonderful music program they there. They do. And also the students from the Young Musicians Forum. Where's so that? bringing up their kids. They perform, it's it's a group of kids around the area, okay. and they perform at different libraries. Oh, and I, I was like not this. aware of that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And um, one person, uh, Quintography um, that I, I, I saw, saw that. on Word, here. I'm going, yes. Wait, wait a minute, what and is that? And Bien is going to be Michael Clement is our ever present He's wonderful. accompanist. He's wonderful. And He's going to be performing with you, right, Rosie? Yes, he, yes, he is. is. Yeah, wonderful. In our last group, someone called and said, um, 
can I perform for you? And it's like, well, we're, we're filled, oh. but we could go into April 3rd, and it turns out that is Music in Library Week or something. Well, that so worked out good. It worked out very well. So these are people that, again, are around here, and I say this to every concert goer, these people are here for you. Yeah. Go to the newspaper, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, find out what else they're doing and support them right, because right. they've come here for your pleasure. Exactly, Let, let's talk to Roseanne here. Now Roseanne, you've been performing in the area. I see your name here and there and so you do perform. You're a soprano. Yes. What is your, your background? Well, I actually have a, a background in education and I did not formally go to school for music but I've been singing for many years and I've studied with uh, Karen Renung, um, I've just always sung from uh, being a, a child, and um, um, I've had the opportunity to uh, be the president of the Monday Musical Club. Oh yeah, I know, I know that. Yeah, yeah, and, they've been um, on the show actually. Yes, and we've yeah. had. I've had a lot of very nice experiences. Uh, I've worked with some wonderful musicians um, over the course of time. Um, I, I, of course, have been studying and working uh, with Michael Clement for many years. Um, he a is marvelous such a blessing. Musician. Oh, he's wonderful. Um, and so I continue to coach with him on a regular basis. Um, now you're going to be performing with uh, the Beat the Snow concert, and this is about yes. Canto. What, what, tell me, this is on the 30th of September? Uh, 30th of January. Oh, January. Where is and, September? Um, Where did I get <laughs> September? You may have you may have a full uh, no, year. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Three months is plenty. I don't know where September, but it is January. I knew that. Um, this. Uh, uh, this is a, a program that I have uh, put together originally for the American Italian Heritage Museum and Association. Mm, yeah, mm. And I performed this in uh, uh, November uh, for their birthday uh, concert. Now, um, I will be doing this again on January 30th, and it's all um, Italian opera favorites and uh, some Neapolitan songs oh, as well. Oh, I love, I love, well, being Italian, you know, I would love that. <laughs> but listen, okay. can you give us a little sample of your singing? I know it won't be bel canto, but you're gonna be doing a little something for Christmas? Yes. Okay, yes, good, so she's gonna stand up and do it. <laughs> I hope that people enjoy it. It reminds me of home, and this good, is a, good, a lovely uh, time of year to be inspired. Okay, good. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. From now on, our troubles will be miles away. Here we are, as in olden days, happy golden days of yore. Faithful friends who are dear to us gather near to us once more through the years we all will be together if the fates allow hang a shining star upon the highest voice and I'm sure that they're going to be so excited to see you on the 30th of January. That's right. Got the right month, right? Thank <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here today and I hope that you'll come on the show again sometime thank next you time so you much. want to do it and you know any anytime we'd love to have you here.
Thank you so much for being here. Okay, and uh, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get people to come to the event, right? Yes, and I have to say on January 9th, someone you know is going to be there. Malcolm Kogod. Oh, let's see if I can remember who he is. I know, yeah, I, know. I know. Let me think. Yeah. Actually, he's my associate producer. So. Yes. <laughs> so Malcolm's going to be there, and he's going to bring some of his singers, and then... Uh, Would that be the Colony Village thing? Yes, okay, yes. Good. And then he and I and all of them are going to be doing a sing-along. Oh, so, I love sing-along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we hand out sheets of paper, and... People love to sing, and you know, it's really good for us to sing along. It's also good to have music. It lifts music our is so spirit. important. It's so important. It lifts our you spirit. know, it, it lifts your spirits. It really it does. does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And again, it's a wonderful series. People will need to probably, you know, we've got to follow the um, prescriptions that are there so bring a mask yep. and have your card your vaccination card we don't know between now and January what's going to well, happen it's in January the library 15th, I know that we will be doing that yes so, yeah. so you have to have masks yeah and we will be taping it um, we generally are very good about beating the snow but occasionally we do live in the Northeast yeah. so, so we will in. be taping it yeah. if the snow is really really bad then you can just sit back in a day or so and watch the concert great yeah. so thanks so much Jan for being here and we hope that you get a good turnout I know the room is wonderful and yes and uh, and the other thing is while you're watching this we are all in in the room everybody that's in this room is masked except when they come to the table and we are six feet apart, so we try and, and maintain some type of COVID, um, uh, being careful anyway, we'll put it that way. Okay, and Marie Campbell is with me. Hi, Marie. Hi. First time we've met. Hi, Marie. And you are a florist, and did I read that you were an RN first? I was, I guess I still am a nurse. Yeah, well, yeah. no, I know that, but I mean, you, yes. you've kind of yeah, morphed did. into a new career. I, I did. I, I practiced nursing for 35 years and yeah. decided to go into the floral business. Yeah, something yes. different. How exciting that, that must be to, to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, so you, you've opened up a place in Albany. Yes. And what do you kind of have... Um, a theme of what you do, or or is it like whatever anybody wants? Tell tell me a little it's, bit. It's all occasion. We okay. do anywhere from weddings to funerals to engagement, any events that require floral uh, arrangements or settings. Uh -huh. We do. So uh, so and you got started. Uh, how long have you been doing this? You know, I was doing it for five years on the side, just outside of my home doing galas and different events and um, COVID kicked in and um, things were a little slow and one day I decided to do Mother's Day in my neighborhood. In oh, Pineville. Mother's Day in your neighborhood. <laughs> How cool is that? And uh, I, apparently everyone uh, had no flowers, <laughs> you know, the local grocery stores and the floral, floral shops were, were closed and it was just right between Madden and Washington Avenue. and. It was very, very, very busy. <laughs> so how did, I'm so you had to have, I mean, obviously you can't go in your backyard and pick flowers. So you have to have suppliers. So how do you do that? I mean, they come out of what, California or where? They, they, they come from California, um, Canada, um, Ecuador. Um, the roses are definitely from uh, the um, South America. Really? Yeah. The flowers come from yeah. South America? Oh, How do they keep them fresh that long? I mean, stop. I mean, I have trouble keeping them in my vase that long. Yeah, yeah so they're, they're not preserved. They're just cut and um, they're shipped. In they, temperature, uh, they watch the temperature. Exactly. And certain flowers are shipped in water and I think they land in Miami and then they just get rushed up to Albany. And here they are. They're so it's a like very tight go. schedule that you have with them. So how do you even know how to order flowers? I'm, I'm just trying to understand well, the, the, yeah. the, the business of being a floral. Well, they're, my buyer, they have a huge um, cooler. Um, when they're fried or sent here, they are cooled at a certain temperature. And everything is monitored. So when I go to pick them up, it's a matter of prepping, cutting, nipping and then putting them in a certain temperature of water, and then they start opening up. 
as they start drinking. Yeah, and I'm sure you're there saying, oh, that would be perfect in there. You know, <laughs> exactly. So you are also a floral designer. Yes, I am. Did you, I mean, how do you learn how to do that? Is it just kind of like, I know sometimes yes. I can tell what looks yeah. good and what doesn't. Yeah. Is that kind of how you do it? Uh, well, online classes does help. And then I had a designer that was doing this for 70 something years and they featured him in a newspaper, which was Phil Copeland. And he taught me how to design. He was. He, very good. He worked out of New York City, and um, it was just this craftsman that, you know, I, I think it was a gift. I keep saying yeah, God, yeah, I yeah. sent him there to do an assignment, and that assignment that's completed. And you kind of have an eye for things. You know, you know what colors to work with. You, and I, I think coming from an island as well. And you know, you're from Jamaica originally, I, I, and of course born, flowers yes. there are so prevalent. It, it, it's funny, when I see the bird of paradise, it reminds me of growing Home. up as yeah. yeah, as a little girl. And, and you probably just, had them all over, yeah. and here yeah, we yeah. think, oh, they're so the, precious. The, the, I, I know, even the poinsettias, they're yeah, in a pot and certain sides. In Jamaica, they're like huge plants. And yeah. You never, I mean, you appreciated that, but now when you look back, you're like, oh my God, these were running wild. Yeah, yeah. Christmas time, run this time of the year. Yeah, and the poinsettia yeah. is such an interesting plant because mm -hmm. I, um, I had one, and and, and of course the red left, you know, because it's green now. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the, tr the leaves got mottled, mottled, I think that's the word I want. And I thought, oh my God, they're dying. And yeah. they were really just turning red. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, that, so do you carry plants as well? We do, uh -huh. yeah, we do carry plants. I have a green thumb and I, I just love to nurse the plants. It's nice to see them at a certain stage and height and size. And then as uh, you nurse them along, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I talk to my plants, you know. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I talk to them all the time. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, I was laughing because somebody said, well, I have an aloe plant, and I call it, and he, um, Edgar Aloe Poe, po, he calls it, <laughs> which made me laugh. Yeah. And then I thought, well, I, you know, I go by and I go, hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I do talk to my yeah, plants as well. Exactly. Uh, so if someone would like to purchase some flowers or something, do you ship them? I mean, we, can you we, send them? We, we deliver. We're in the process of doing. Uh, but you, you can, up. Could, can I order flowers from you and send them to California? Not at this okay. moment. Okay. We're working on that. It's been so busy at Bloom's Yeah, Creek. you just are d yes, local. It, that we do local at the moment, but okay. we're working on it. Yeah. We're yeah. looking at some different air, teleflower. Well, I mean, because you have to, you have to sign up and pay exactly. fees and everything, yeah. so you got to know what you're doing. It, exactly, yeah. and we want to make sure that those who are or in a different state, or get in the same quality yeah. that Blooms by Marie provides. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Well, and where are you located so people know? I'm at 811 Madison Avenue. You're right on Madison very, Avenue. It's very hard not to see the shop. It has four Christmas trees in the window. Four Christmas trees? Well, yeah. yes. okay, you're not yeah. selling Christmas trees, though. I know, we're just decorating. Because it's, <laughs> no, I know. It, the, the window is really not for the shop that I describe. It really is for the community. Ex the absolutely. The, you know, it has teddy We bears. love to see something festive. It, exactly, and yeah. books, and it, there's so many folks stop by and just observe and little kids love the teddy bears and the night before Christmas books and oh yeah, nice yeah so and walk by her shop and that's yeah, yeah good it's, it's, it's on welcome. Madison Avenue it what? is 811 Madison okay. in Albany New okay, York okay good whereabouts yes. is that on, on it's Madison? between Quail and um, Ontario on Ontario okay yes okay just to kind of get a, a time yes. I want to thank you so much for being here, and I love to talk to entrepreneurs because, and especially one that has gone from one profession, which of course you're still licensed, of course, yes. but one profession and morphed into maybe something you've always wanted to do. Yes. Yeah, and yes. did it. Thank you so much for and being thank here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's yes. a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Good. Same here. We're going to uh, just uh, br briefly go right over here and talk to Tanya. What's going on? You have a play going on, is that right? And All it's right. in Russian. And in English. Is that yeah, right? I think it's very unusual, but uh, we have a dual language adaptation of the uh, one of the Russian Jewish author, uh, Frederick Gerenstein, yeah. uh, titled Birdichev. And uh, we say that again do... because I'm trying. Yeah. To, I know Ron is okay. coming here to sit down, and Bir he's trying to teach me how to say it. <laughs> Birdichev is a, uh, the name of the town yeah. in uh, Soviet Union and in Central uh, Ukraine now. And it's the mostly populated by Jewish people. Okay. And uh, everyone in the Soviet Union and Russia, Ukraine, know where the uh, title um, for the play because of town. 
yeah. names, but uh, for the uh, American premiere, this is going to be American premiere of this play, uh, it is going to be a different title, The, the Family That Never Was. Okay. So okay. Going to be and and well, Ron Miller's joined us, and he's our stage manager, is that right? Yes, I'm working very closely with the, Ameri with the English language production. Yeah. And, and you uh, have Oleg uh, Golub doing Oleg the Golub other yes. the, our artistic director. Yeah. For the Russian. Uh, no, no, for both. For this both. Is two, oh, uh, she's doing shit for both. Two casts and them. one director. Oh, okay, got it. I'm just trying to, you know, figure out how you do two and two, I mean, two uh, languages. It's, it's really unusual. <laughs> well, we have a director who's a real treasure. and uh, Who's your director? He's, his name is Oleg Golub, okay. not related to the local <laughs> No, Golub I knew, I knew <laughs> that. I knew that it couldn't be. <laughs> and um, he's got an extensive uh, stage and film background um, in, in Moscow. He's, um, how did you find it? <laughs> I know, I'm, I, I was stunned he's, when I, I saw the, the whole write-up on it. Yeah. Yes, yes, he's, um, uh, it's been wonderful working with him. And he's, he's uh, crafted this adaptation that we're using, which um, well, we haven't been able to talk much about the, the play, but what I'm really impressed with is because the world premiere of this play was in 2014 at the Mayakovsky Theater in Moscow. Oh, it was in Moscow. It was okay. in Moscow. And it's still in Moscow. And it's still it's, running in this uh, uh, play in, uh, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. and, it says um, 2014. Wow. Right. From 2014, although the play was written in 1975. But what I'm so struck by is how our ad adaptation is so much different than the Mayakovsky Theater version. Um, but there's so much material in the original script. Is it, did you did you kind of tighten it? Was that it? I mean, what well, you, they did. Uh, I mean, not you personally, bit. but their version. The Moscow Theater they did not have uh, the, the whole play what is no. going to be written because it's the big. Uh, we never have a, a play with a, uh, uh, two acts. Uh, before, but now we have to have a, a two acts and the intermission because the mm -hmm. plays are the big. It's, it's longer. Okay. All right. Let Let's talk about the play, <laughs> the play because it, it's not. Uh, it's a different type. A different look at the Holocaust. Is that correct? It's not about the Holocaust. Right. That's what I mean. It's a different. Yeah. It's after a Holocaust. After time. the Holocaust. And. But I'm sure it's referred to. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but it's really about. The, f the family, and it's about the effects of the Holocaust, you know, the lives of these people afterwards, and uh, and, and how they just survive and continue. Um, they, um, um, you know, it's a character play, and it, you know, the, the show really relies on how the characters interact with with each other. Um, and, and I wanted to under, say we have a 16 characters in the play, yes. and we have a wow. 12 adults and the four children. Yes. And now are they? I'm sorry. Did, I, I'm trying to get this. You have the same cast for both? No. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to so say I can't a, even imagine. That. <laughs> right. We have a so 30 something uh, different actors. One is playing in Russian, and one is playing. Okay, in so English. you have two casts. Okay. Yes. Now, you're doing this on two weekends, and I think the dates are the 14th and 15th of January and the 21st and 22nd. Yes. Are you doing one of each, each weekend? Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, we, we, we started with the premiere of, with American cast on uh, uh, January 14th. The next day is going to be a Russian team. That's what I say, you're doing yes. one of each, yes. each weekend. So you have an opportunity on either weekend to see one right. or the other, or both, yeah. if you're good. <laughs> yeah, actually both because we are going to have a uh, for the Russian uh, play we have going to have a, 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 a display with the translation. So someone really, be, right? Wow! So someone's going to be see two plays. <laughs> How are you doing it? I mean, are you going to scroll it? I mean, no, it's just going to be screen and it's going to be. Oh, you're going to put up on a screen. Okay, screen, got it. Yes. Got, yeah, yeah. The translation. Right. That's what I. Uh, closed captioning plays. Who knew? <laughs> But, you know, it's hard enough to do one show, but to do two shows at the same time. Well, do you find, <laughs> I mean, this is probably kind of a dumb question, but do you find that the one done in Russian might be different in, in the production than the English? The production because it, is seems, it seems to me that mm -hmm. the Russian language is so expressive. Exactly. This is production exactly the same. The yeah. words exactly yeah, yeah. the same. 
but we realize that the American version uh, uh, solved the. That's what I'm just saying. That's Russian, why I said it. Fe I, it's, I felt that it would be a different. It's a bit different because. I don't know, maybe it's so many different uh, uh, words for the same expression in Russian and it's going to be, I don't know, it, it, it is going to be somehow it's the, in English softer than in Russian. Yeah, yeah. it was funny because my mother used to say, she uh, born in Italy, and she said, oh, she says, oh, there's no word in English for the, for the Italian word, you know. Yes. So I'm sure it's the same in Russian. There's certain things that translation doesn't quite get the real meaning of it. But I would like to say that this is not a comedy. No, no, this no. is a tragic comedy. Yeah. And this is the, about the harsh life. So it's going to be harsh language <laughs> as well. That's OK. I mean, it's real. It's well, real. I mean, that's yes. what we're, we're that's talking right. about, realism yes. rather than right. anything else. And where is this going to be? I understand it's going to be in Schenectady, right? Yes, it's going to be. We're so excited. We found new, uh, beautiful theater, the, uh, uh, the new Neil and Jane Golub theater, yeah. theater at the Boys and Girls w Were they a little club. surprised when they saw it was the Golub Theater? Oh, when yes. Golub, when Golub is... <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. 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 So oh, Oleg my... said, what? I have a theater here? <laughs> and he grabbed his camera and... <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. It was surprised. But theater right. is beautiful. It's the brand new, and they have a beautiful stage, beautiful lighting system. And you can see probably in our post already, we have a... a yeah, we've a, been putting them up. I'm, yeah. yeah, we have already a stage photo shootings, and it's beautiful uh, with a lighting like that. It's like a piece of art, like a picture. And by the way, the table with what you can see, uh, they made uh, uh, by Ron. Ron. Oh, really? Not only stage manager, uh, he's also the ground writer for this particular project. And he's actor, and he is prop... Uh, uh, maker. Okay, let's see. Uh, very, very important so person. So the entire set. So don't based... get sick. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. We. Everybody is very yeah. important. Everybody. I said the entire set is an old Victorian table. I saw the picture. Yeah. Seven Victorian. You know, style. You know, style, Old chairs all around it. So you don't have to do a lot of sets. No, it's character driven. Like I said. I love character you know, driven plays. I so, really like that, and that's the one thing that you don't see. I'm sorry. In American films, they mm -hmm. they're very very few are character driven. Mm -hmm. Whereas you looked at foreign films, and they seem to go on the character. It's a different style, and yes. I love looking into the people, not yes. just you know lots of activities. There. And this oh. is theater for an actor's actor, you okay. know, because of of uh, just the intensity of the interactions. And the nature of the characters, you know, they're, um, um, you know, blue-collar Jewish yids yeah. in uh, central Ukraine during the Soviet era. Yeah. And I would like know. to bring uh, attention to okay. the name. I, well, of first of all, I want to thank you, Ron, for being here because you're an amazing man to do all of that and pee. So I'm hoping I can get a ticket and see that. No, oh, crazy, not amazing. No, well, a little of each. <laughs> Got to be crazy uh, to you. <laughs> theater, you know, it does that to you. <laughs> but thank you for being here today. Okay, and we'll go back to you, Tanya. So tell me about... Uh, uh, I would like to say about the... Um, um, what is the name of the of the place of the uh, the play we are going to choose? That's uh, the family that never was, and I not um, telling you why it was named like this, mm -hmm. but you have to come to the show and realize why artistic director choose this name for the show. The Original family that title, never was, yeah. Never was, that, yes. What an interesting title. Yes. And uh, you need to be there to figure out. Yeah. And there is a charge for it. So they can, and where, how do they get their tickets? Can they get them online okay. or buy they, them there? Their tickets, yes. Their tickets online. We put it at Eventbrite. It's $18 for adults sure. and $10 for students and senior citizens. Okay, good. So congratulations. Right, by the way, while I have you here, are you doing a winter festival? Unfortunately not. Yeah, so you're doing this instead. Yes, yeah, instead. I know. It's a little bit, things are a little tough, but every year I go to your winter festivals because I absolutely love them. They are just so, they just, I, I leave and I'm feeling good. Uh, <laughs> we will, we will, hopefully, next yeah, year. Go back to it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank I love you. what you do. Thank okay, you. we're going to go to our next guest and we're going to be talking about, well, we're still in the, the holiday season, but 
Chris, the trees are coming, and they're coming they're to <laughs> the Historical Society and to the Y. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. They're yeah. actually already here. This is, we're in our second week right now. I know you started our, on the fourth, I believe. Yes, we started on December fourth, and it runs through December twenty-third. Okay. And how many trees do you have? Oh boy, we have probably between seventy-five and eighty trees uh, between both sites. Wow. Yeah. Now, just so people understand, you didn't decorate all these trees. No. So the Festival of Trees. Um, invites sponsors from throughout the community. So we have a number of um, both like local businesses um, and other not-for-profit organizations. And, and they do a theme on their trees. Yep, so think? most each tree has its own theme. Um, some are witty, some are fun, some are a little bit more somber and serious, some are you know decorated in, in traditional styles. Uh, so we have a, quite a variety of different types of trees. So how many trees do you have at the Historical Society? At the Historical Society we probably have around 40, 45 trees I believe. You get yeah. 45, well, yeah. because I was there. Do you still have the one that's hung upside down? Yes. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah, Who does a, that uh, one? I actually do that one. You I kinda, do the upside yeah, down do, tree. Yeah. I started it a couple years ago and it's been a fan favorite ever since. And well, so and you I know the cat can't tradition. get to it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> or the true. kids, you know. <laughs> You know, because exactly. I mean, we used to always, when I had the cat, I had to start here to, <laughs> and up to, because you didn't have any decorations right. below. Is there a charge to see these? Uh, yes, so the charge is $6, um, and then 12 and under is free. Okay, and, and where does the money go? The money is uh, split between us and the YWCA. It goes to, it's our annual fundraiser, so it goes to all of our programming throughout the year um, and various other activities that we participate in throughout the year. And you have an event coming up tonight, don't you? I mean, we do. We yeah, have our, um, our the first of our of our holiday stockade stroll. So it's a, a uh, holiday sort of Christmas themed um, uh, walking tour of the stockade. Okay, and what other events? Because I know you, I love your walking tours. I've been on yeah. a few of them. Uh, so tell me what else. You, but could you you have book? I mean, you do reviews of books and things like that. So yeah, I've, actually, I believe. Um, yeah, you're our sitting next right guest here. Actually, you don't know be, it, but, yeah. but William Patrick <laughs> is sitting next to us, and he's going to be yeah. uh, actually working with you as well. Yeah, so we're we're helping to sponsor that event. Uh, we have a number of we are doing our um, Christmas caroling or holiday uh, caroling at the Maybe Farm Historic Site in December. Uh, we have so we have lots of stuff going on. Yeah, it's, and you do so much, and you do a lot at the uh, Maybe Farm as well. We do. Yeah, we'll be kind of slowing. You have down. an exhibit there, don't you? We no? do have an exhibit there. It's called um, uh, Crafted in Schenectady, uh, Building of Community. So it's a, uh, a exhibit sort of focusing on sort of uh, handcrafted arts in Schenectady throughout, uh, throughout the ages. Yeah, so it's real. I mean, you do so much. I mean, it's not just... I mean, are, are the, the costumes, of course, are gone. The fashion is gone. That is, yeah, is so we gone. took that down. Um, uh, because earlier. you had to put the yes, trees up. Exactly. I mean, you had to swap them out for the trees. Yeah, yes. yeah. So what's your next exhibit coming up? Our next exhibit is going to be taking a look at collection, uh, collecting, actually. So it's going to be sort of uh, discussing how people collect, why we collect, so, um, the 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 types of uh, collections that both we have at the museum and then people might have in their personal lives as well. Okay, and I just want to ask you, uh, this is a personal thing, excuse me, I, you have a library uh, of, of uh, genealogy, is that we correct? We do, so we do have a research library and Because uh, I have to come down and look through yeah. some of the, do you have the old directories? <laughs> we do, yes. I'm we coming there because I need to find yeah. out something. Yeah. Those are a really good resource for, for yeah. people who are And when are you researching. open? Uh, so we're open, well we're open for the Festival of Trees uh, weekly, or daily, uh, yeah. throughout the week, Monday through Sunday, 5 a.m. to, or 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Whoa, you get up early! <laughs> 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then uh, this Friday we will be we will be doing a uh, sort of evening um, hours till 8 okay. p.m. Yeah, good. And you bring the kids yeah. too. Yes, to see absolutely. Them. Yeah, they absolutely. love the trees. Love the yeah. trees yeah. Susanna, it's always good to have you on the show. Well, You're always a delightful thank guest. You. And uh, please say hi to Mary. And I of wish course. you both uh, happy holidays. Happy as holidays. Well. Thank you. Thanks so much Thanks. for being here. We're going to switch right over to a guest she talked about just during her conversation. We're going to be talking to William Patrick. Hey, what do you have here? And the, the title of your book looks like it's going to be one of those book, library books that people are going to want to read. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, and I, listen, I know you got a big thing coming up on Friday. We do. At 4 o'clock at do. the Stockade yep. Inn. It's right here, yep. Um, Stockade Inn, uh, Schenectady County Historical Society sponsors it. Um, Schenectady Heritage Foundation, yep. Stockade Association. Uh, John Samatolsky, of course, is redoing. The I know stuff John. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he does great stuff. He's an amazing man. So yeah, it'll be fun to be in there because um, he's, he's just getting going. 
That's yeah, this um, is the book. Here it is, right? Book. I'm going to put it right there. I brought that copy for you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to read it. Um, it's interesting because I grew up in Schenectady when the GE and the ALCO were humming, humming, humming. Okay, and I think they employed between them around 400,000, I mean, uh, lots of people. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I, not that many, but thirty thousand, I think, were in. Well, forty-five, forty-five thousand at the main plant. Yeah. In, during World War II. Oh, two. Okay. Um, and about twelve thousand at the Alco yeah. plant, yeah. but they closed in '69. Yeah. And so, the Sherman tanks came from there, I believe. Absolutely. Yep. In conjunction, they did those. I remember as a kid seeing the tanks coming down the. Yeah. Actually, there's a picture of that in the book. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, have, I can't wait to look. Yeah. And I'm, I'm dating myself, but hey, that's the way it is. No, no, no. Those tanks, I mean, that was a big deal. It's connected to some It was a big deal. Before they got shipped over to northern Africa, yeah. they actually stopped Rommel. Yeah, yeah, Rommel. Yeah. yeah. The, he well, came he over the hill. Well, he was the, the, what, the and, Desert Fox. Or that's desert right. Fox, he was yeah. the Desert Fox. The Where British, did that come the from? The British <laughs> bought those tanks, and they used them to defeat Rommel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... You know, when you stop to think what an impact Schenectady had on so many things. I mean, we're talking electricity, we're talking about General Electric, you know, turbines now, and talking about the Alco with the, the train. I mean, there were so many things that came out of Schenectady. Huge manufacturing what happened? hub. What happened? Well, a lot of things happened. It wasn't just um, the downsizing of GE, although that, of course, had a lot and to do with it. And it's continuing. Yes and no. Yes and no. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but a lot of things, between the 60s, mid-60s, and the mid-90s, a lot of things changed in the country. So there was deindustrialization happening. You know, large companies, General Motors, General Electric. Outsourcing, yeah. They were outsourcing. They were, you know, going, going global, certainly. Um, but they were also moving businesses to different parts of, of the country for various reasons. And there was also the, the flight to the suburbs happening at the same time, you know, and that wasn't necessarily the fault of big companies. Um, so there were a lot of things happening as the, as the cities emptied out of people who had lived there for generations. Absolutely. Of course, new My people. My family did, yeah. Yeah, sure. New people came in yeah. from other larger metropolitan areas. And they tended to be renters rather than owners, so that changed the... That changed the dynamics of a city, big of time. a community, of a neighborhood. Yeah, and there, of course, you know, cause and effect. Yeah. Right, so one thing happens, another thing reacts to that. And Schenectady lost 30,000 people over about 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And didn't, didn't get them back. Yeah. You know, we had 95,000 people in this city in the 50s. No, I know that. And, and I remember... we got 65. I remember, uh, if you look down, even at noon, it down at Erie Boulevard. If you were standing at the corner of State Street and looking down at Erie Boulevard, it was a sea of people yeah, yeah. walking up Erie Boulevard to go to shopping, to go to eat, whatever it was. It was so vibrant as to what was going on during that period. And of course we have to, you know, it was GE that did it. I mean, because they were there and they were the ones that were bringing the people into work. Right, right. So how, I mean, I, you, you use the word combative. Tell me how you chose that word. Well, you know, there's, there's lots of conflict all the time, right? Um, so there's literal conflict, political battles, strikes against GE. Um, oh, I remember the strikes, yeah. Oh, those were, were ugly, ugly, ugly. Although they didn't start for a long time. You know, GE was very, first of all, we're a good employer for a long, long time. But at the same time, they're very clever in keeping workers happy. So a lot of workers didn't want to join the union. In here, I talk about Helen Carini. Who oh, was, Helen's been on my show. Oh my God, who was an she was. Oh, she went. She went to all of their meetings. She was. She was big time in the union. Yeah. But what I, I used her diaries, um, in here, which I got from my side, and for a long time she didn't want to join the union, for a number of reasons. But a lot of people felt the same way. They didn't want to join the union. They had good jobs. Their families had good jobs. Yeah. Um, so so there was that. But combat. Um, combat can be good, can be bad, right? The resilience of the Schenectady people literally getting knocked down over and over again and coming back is a kind of combat, a kind of personal mm -hmm. struggle mm -hmm. for survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at Proctor's, I mean, here we are in Proctor's, right? In 1975, this entire gonna, place, well, this was a Carl company where we yeah, were. They were gonna they were going to be demolished. Yeah. And then the city was going to sell it for a dollar. You know, I mean, there were holes in the ceiling. There were pigeons flying through the seats. It was, you know, really, it was 50 years old and it was falling apart. 
Well, a lot of people didn't got have together. a caretaker. Didn't, didn't, have, didn't have anybody. To no, take that's care what of. I mean. There was no one looking yeah. over it. But then all of a sudden, the people in the community who valued Proctors who cared about it came together, launched a huge volunteer mm -hmm. effort. Yeah. You know, which is extensively, you know, talked so about. So that's in, the book. in here as well. So you, so you touch on Proctors as well. Yeah. Oh, a lot, a yeah. lot. Um, not only the history of Proctors, but the history of FF Proctor. Frederick yeah, Proctor yeah, yeah, yeah. When 1926, this was built. 26, yeah, but he came right. earlier. Well, he, he built a lot of. of he, he had 54 theaters. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout the country. Mostly the east, but east, yeah. a little bit, a little bit west too. Yeah. But mostly the east. Um, but the first one was in 1911, 1912, uh, which is down at, at Erie Boulevard in the state. Um, he took over a theater. I remember. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that he had one before this one. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, as he realized that Schenectady was a huge market, and of course, 1910 to 1920, GE was huge. I mean, the population went from about 50,000 to 95,000 in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm building a big palace. So he built And this them. was it. This was the most ornate theater he ever built. Yeah. This Proctor's. So the yeah, fact and, that and the people brought it back, that's it's amazing. It's a gorgeous theater. Oh my God. But, but think about this. What happened to the Plaza Theater, which was amazing as well? Went away. They tore it down and put a parking lot in here. That I mean, <laughs> I remember as a kid going into Proctor or uh, the Plaza and, and looking up, and you know, and the clouds were rolling across right. the ceiling, and you had the balconies on this. It was like magical to yeah, go there. That was an atmospheric vaudeville theater. They called it atmospheric okay. as opposed to it was atmospheric. Was. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was a gorgeous place, and now it's MVP's it's parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. I think that was the catalyst for a lot of people in to, town. To save this one. Yeah. You you know, we lost the plaza, let's not lose, you know, everything. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's interesting, but this is beautiful. But So you touch on all things, and it was kind of interesting that, I mean, the, the theme of Golub is coming up again because we just talked about them in a couple, in the last one, but that Mona really wanted you to write a book about Neil, and you said, and he said, no way. That's right, that's right. The Golubs were absolutely integral to this process. It was Mona's idea. And she and I went to see Neil, and she you know, said, how about we do a memoir? And he said, hmm, I'm not gonna do a memoir. He said, what I care about is the economic revitalization of Schenectady. And there you go. And so that's, that's how it started. Yeah. It started out as a business book with a relatively narrow scope, and I realized almost immediately that it wasn't No, this is work. a tome. This is, this is a book that, yeah, it's, and I see you got pictures, and this is the first time I've handled the book. A few pictures in here. Uh, so this is like, you illustrate what you need to illustrate. Yeah, this is kind of the whole story. Yeah, yeah. You know, how did Schenectady fall into it. disrepair? Yeah. Um, what was Schenectady 2000? What was their role? How did that, you know, segue? Yeah, into the Schenectady 2000. What happened to them? Oh my goodness, I remember doing their galas. They did their work for seven they or did eight it, years. And that was it. And then it became Metroplex. Yeah. I mean, that's Bob Farley and Neil Golub, Roger Hull. They're yeah. the ones who basically yeah. got Metroplex started. Exactly. And now Ray Gillen is over there. And yeah, and now yeah. we see what Metroplex has done for the city, really, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you've, you've got all these different strains of people who've been working. You know, you've got the Golubs, you've got the Gillens, you've got you know the big things, Schenectady 2000, Metroplex. You've got Civitello, who's working too, yeah, very hard at it. but then you've got it. other philanthropists, you've yeah. got foundations, nonprofits, um, all the grassroots people in Hamilton Hill, Vail, Bellevue, I mean, this All the small neighborhoods that are working hard to improve their uh, their appearance and improve the which, which is another form of combat yeah. in a sense. You yeah. know, these are people who have said, you know, we love our city. We're going to fight to save our city, and so this book is really it's about the good fight. It's what I call the good fight. Absolutely, it's a community of people who realize cities are collaborations. Yeah, you know, they're not just haphazard things. They're designed places. Yeah. And if you care about your place and you want it to work, you've got to work together to make that happen. Exactly, exactly. Well, I'm a big, I've always been a big fan of Schenectady. I grew up here, so, you know, it's one of those things that I have probably, I hate to say it, walked on every street in this city That's because I had relatives, you know, here and there. And, you know, my mother didn't drive, and I was walking to, from, uh, I lived on Eastern Avenue. I would walk over to 7th Avenue on, at Mount Pleasant to visit my grandmother. Where did you grow up? Which neighborhood? On Eastern Avenue. On Eastern, lower, upper. Uh, lower, lower Eastern, yeah, where the Metroplex is doing where the, the, a huge the, amount the, of work um, there. The St. Mary's Church is. I oh, was yeah. one door away from that. 
They're doing so much good work on Eastern Avenue. Yeah, they are. I see. I just drove by it yesterday and saw that there's a new building right across from the church, and then they, then they yeah. took the old St. Mary's School, and they've rehabbed that. Yep, yep. That's and, the whole Renaissance and of course, complex. what they're doing with the church, with the Renaissance. I mean, it's. I, I mean, know. lots of good stuff going on. All over the city. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Yeah, going let's on. be cheerleaders. Uh, you bring <laughs> yeah, your pom not? poms, and I'll bring mine, <laughs> and we'll cheer. And I'm going to try and get to see you on Friday. You're going to be at the Stockade Inn at four o'clock to uh, to do a reading, I believe. And yep, there'll be a reading between five and five thirty. Okay. Reading. There'll be a signing before and after. Good. Refreshments. Um, the, the new Stockade Inn. It's going to be great. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to to meet you in person. And I know I've known Carmel for ages, but she, yeah. She says hello. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm so so excited to read this. Thanks, Anne. Thanks good. for having Thank me. Thank you on. for being here. We're going to just switch over and talk about the post office, right? So tell me what's going on, Jim, because I know you are a proponent of good postal service. Well, more than that, I'm a proponent of public postal service. I love that, the people's post office. Correct, right. which was how it started, how it should remain. But I have to clarify that I'm not here representing the postal service. No, I know you aren't. I worked for the postal service for 30 years, retired in 2014. I am 38th year member now of the American Postal Workers Union in Albany, New York. And 20 of those years to the date today, I am the legislative director. Director, so you know what's going on. And I, and I mentioned hand, to you, first when, you look at it. Yeah. when you came in, I showed you an article that I saw in the paper just this morning in the Schenectady Gazette, and it had to do with the um, issue of the, uh, well, there it is. It says, Congress slouches as postal workers hustle. I got to tell you, those post postal services, they have to hustle because they got very little to work with. Oh, they, they, this goes back a long way. Now, we, we established as a public institution older than this country itself. I did not know that you, when you told me 1700? Well, no, when uh, colonial times, Ben Franklin was made the first postmaster general before I, You our know, I should know that, written. but I didn't. And then when the Constitution was written, it was in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, giving Congress authority to set up post routes and postal roads. And later on, in 1792, there was a Post Office Act drafted, which, if I can refer to my notes, yeah, go ahead. It, it established that the Congress would, uh, would run the Postal Service or, or oversee the Postal Congress. Service as opposed to the executive branch. Okay, because, because there's three branches of government. Yeah. Right, Congress is more reflective of the views of the people with the people voting for congressional representatives. So, uh, in the early days, the post office would deliver its mail by way of uh, pony or uh, train. Um, Any way to get it to the people. Right, now as the country grew, the whistle stop post offices grew into cities and then there were elaborate buildings created for the post office, paid for by the people, and th these buildings would uh, be a symbol of pride and confidence and strength, so that people would have pride in their post, uh, post office. Right, and, and it was almost a center of, I mean, I know I lived in the Midwest for a short time, and it was like people kind of, you know, you'd go there to get your mail or oh, something, yeah. and you'd sit, you'd be chit-chatting and, and saying, hi, oh, Well, that oh, still happens you? in the smaller rural Yeah, yeah, and this today. was a small town. And, uh, the mission uh, to deliver the mail was carried out for nearly two centuries without too much difficulty until latter part of the uh, 20th century. It became a, a, a notion that private industry should take over the postal service. And private industry was all over that because... Yeah, well, they wanted the money. Yeah. There was huge money to be made. Yeah, right. but, but the thing is that there's certain things you don't privatize the military. Why would you privatize well, the postal service? in some service? cases we did privatize the military. Yeah, well, yeah, I, and, I know what you're you know. talking about, the black, yeah, all that. But the point is, is that these things should be kept separate from, from somebody That's saying, I'm going to make money on this and I'm going to do, because it's a service to the community right. and to the individuals. Well, I want to know that I'm going to get my Social Security check or I want to know that if I send, I, I got a thing in the mail from, or email, from one of the companies and says, we just want to let you know that you may not get your bill on time, so make sure that you do something so it's paid on time. Yeah, and I'm they thinking, want you to pay online. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's important to note that even in the uh, Post Office Act of 1792, it's clear 
that this belongs to the people. Yeah. In the Constitution, it's clear that it belongs to the people. And later on in the Reorganization Act, it's clear. It's restated and, every time. And, and as you see over the years, those acts have been just ignored. So what happens is they got the uh, Presidential Commission in Nixon's day, 1968, to examine the Postal Service was headed up by the uh, former chair of the uh, AT&T, Frederick Capel. Oh, let's see. Is that is that conflict or anything? Yeah. Well, not so much as to sit on a commission, but okay. to make changes to the Postal Service, it would be. Yeah. But he his recommendation was then was to privatize in 1968. Well, because he came from big corporations. Oh yeah, I mean. I mean that's that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like a wolf pack waiting yeah. for the, the the body to fall. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So the American public loved the Postal Service. They still do today, but yeah. they, they were very popular with the American public throughout the, the 1900s. So what happened was the workers were on a strike, a wildcat strike in 1969. They, oh, I remember that, yeah. Nixon couldn't defeat the strike because the workers had the knowledge in their heads, so he had to cave in. But when he caved in, they came up with this Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, which accomplished a lot of things. It gave the workers collective bargaining rights instead of collective begging. It provided for an independent postal service, United States Postal Service, not the post office department anymore. Mm -hmm. The postal service was self-funding, would use no tax dollars, but they had to break even over 10 year cycles. But it also kind of paved the way towards privatization mm -hmm. by turning the postal service into a marketing uh, uh, business or whatever you want to call it, it's still a service, but now it looks like a business. And they had to act like a business. But when they had the, uh, the Postal Reorganization Act, there was a, a line in there that said, the cost of establishing and maintaining the postal service shall not be apportioned to impair the overall value of such service. Right, yeah, yeah. But it has. It, it th it, things have happened that have affected the postal service that have changed the value of the service to the people. Well, I, I know that you're looking at the past, but I'm, I'm going to look right now. Mm -hmm. And I was disturbed, and I, I'm, I'm not going to be ashamed to say this, I was very disturbed when the new director came in, and I understand he was hired by their board, who was kind of put together to affect this change. The first thing he did was take sorting machines which worked beautifully. I, I did a, a them. Yeah. I did well. I did a, um, a video of of the internal uh, over at New Carner Road of how they not New Carner but you know where Carner I am. Road. Yeah, and how they did it. And I got a beautiful tour of it. Saw how those machines will sort things. Why would he have taken those out? And I don't understand you have to why you would disassemble something that worked beautifully right before the election. You have to wonder. Gee, I wonder how that works. <laughs> Let me think about that because I don't think it's too clear to the me. The Postal Board of Governors, which was created after the Reorganization Act, the board members are appointed by the president. I understand They serve that. Uh, staggering terms. And the board itself elects they the elected. postmaster Yes, yeah, so if you, if you kind of stack the, 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 your board, right. you're going to get the result you want when you get the, the director, Exactly. Right? Now, just staying on that topic, the, there was a board member, he actually chaired the board, his name was, uh, let me see if I can find it in my notes. He was David Williams, a former postal inspector, and, and, and until they nominated or approved of DeJoy, he resigned from that board. He was the vice chair of the Board of Governors. And he reported to Congress his disappointment with what was going on. This guy, DeJoy, had like five weeks experience and was trying to yeah, change no, it's, Not only that, years but of, he had, his, his idea was to privatize. That was right, his whole concept. Right, he went in there, after, after years of lean operation where the Postal Service relied on people working overtime, he goes in and says no more overtime. All right, so now you don't have no overtime, you don't have any employees either. So the job isn't gonna get done. Then, yeah. like you said, he dismantled machinery. Yeah. 
So you have to wonder why coming into an election season with ballot mail being t number one. You know, I mean, it's, it's obvious what was going Christmas on. Plus Christmas rush happening. Yeah, you know, you'd so. have to be blind not to see what, you know. Uh, but what led to this was kind of subtle, and it was subtle for a reason. Because the American public loved their postal service, they were not going to tolerate privatization. Right. They tried with Sears in, in the late uh, Reagan administration. Sears tried to have contract stores in their, in their stores with non-postal employees. People threatened to cut up their cards. Yeah. They abandoned that idea. Yeah, yeah. Later in 2013, Staples tried it. The teachers were tremendous advocates for the Postal Service. They threatened to boycott Staples. That was Wouldn't have been so good for Staples. Right, for sure. so they abandoned that. But it just goes so to show you. So the people have power. They were not going to tolerate anyone meddling with their Postal yeah, Service. Yeah. So here's the thing. How do, you, how do you turn the people against the Postal Service? You crush it. So they and then they say, well, I can't get my mail, and then there are my packages, where are they? 2006, George Bush signed the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds good to me. One of the results of that act was the Postal Service pre-funding retiree health care benefits 75 years into the future over their 10-year cycle. You can't do that. You can't do that. The, re the reorganization required them to break even yeah. in 10 years. I mean, it was like everybody wanted to crush. Yeah. It was trying to crush. So you ruined the service. Yeah. Then we had the, the recession. Businesses were getting bailed out left and right. Nothing for the postal service. Right. Then we had uh, uh, the COVID. And be, before that even, we had a commission from President Trump saying that we should privatize the postal service. That'd be the worst thing that could happen is to privatization. Well, what happens is you lose your universal service. Yep. The prices go crazy. Yeah, because they can set whatever they want. And they might not want to deliver up the mountain anymore. Yeah. You know, you might have to go to the post office and pick up your mail. It's just, it's just no good. Well, they even talked about delivery every other day, and then they talk. Yeah. I mean, they were doing yeah. everything that, well, we can't do that, and we're going to take out the mailboxes, and we're going to well, do Well, they had taken out so many I know they did. Cans. I saw the photos. But the thing is, the people deserve their postal service. They deserve it to run like it had run before all this nonsense started. Yeah. But what happened with the PAEA, we were, we were given $5.5 billion to the Treasury every year until we went broke in 2012. Yeah, yeah. And it, w it was planned, uh, planned to do yeah, that. Yeah, it was definitely. You know, right? Jim, we're almost out of time, but you know what I want to do? I want to have you back on again. Because, I'd love to come back. Because I think that one of the things is this affects all of us. And I, I think that perhaps we don't understand What's going on behind That's just the it. When I come back, I want to go into further detail of we'll some do of the that. things that have occurred. Yeah, we'll do that. And, I, and I'll send you a date. But, but don't, you don't leave, leave. I'm going to tell you who's coming on the next show. We're going to be talking. It's going to be our holiday show. So we're going to be talking about Armenian holiday traditions. We're going to be talking about baking for the holidays. We're going to be talking about German holiday traditions. We're going to talk about Irish holiday traditions. We're going to talk about the, um, well, we're, it's all over with Hanukkah, but it's still it's in this area of season. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about Kwanzaa, which comes up right after Christmas. So got a great lineup coming up next time. And Jim, thank you again for thank being you. here. Thank you, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I can't wait to learn more. I'll this is going back. to be a continuing saga. Thank you. Good. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching.